So welcome back to our uh, workshop on sustainability reporting. We are now moving on to panel two of our stakeholder panels, which is the European, the EU perspective. We've just talked about the global perspective. And as I just said a few minutes ago, the EU is incredibly important. The EU has been ahead on these issues. Uh, there's, of course, a political consensus. We have the new uh, priorities of the European Commission. Its sustainability is everywhere. Uh, we're even talking about reforming competition policy in lines with uh, sustainability. Uh, and as we just heard from the global panel, uh, the European contribution to global efforts is, of course, incredibly important. And to discuss this with us today, we are very privileged to have uh, Alain Degas from uh, DG FISMA. Uh, I think Alain uh, is, is no understatement to say that he's very much leading on this topic uh, within the European institutions. And we also have Pierre-Emmanuel Beluche uh, from the Trésor in France, uh, who will give us uh, the perspective of a very important member state. Let's not forget, it is the Paris Agreement. Uh, and then, of course, we have uh, Rins Abma, who represents Umedion, and I think he'll, he, Rins is going to say something on this. Um, Umedion is, of course, also a very important uh, institution in Europe uh, on the forefront from the Netherlands of uh, everything sustainability. Now, Alain, we will start with you, I think. Uh, the following all the things that are coming out of the European Commission is incredibly complicated. There's so much going on, and we are really hoping that you can uh, enlighten us uh, what 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 you what you're doing, which is incredibly important. Well, thank you, uh, thank you very much, um, uh, also for the invitation to uh, to speak uh, during this event. Um, and I've uh, found all the contributions so far very very interesting, um, and the uh, the academic discussion has also infused some rigor into the debate, which uh, we sometimes. Uh, uh, miss in in policy making, so that's very a uh, very interesting contribution too, uh, and it strikes me that um, um, as economists, of course, um, uh, Christian um, uh, invoked uh, Milton Friedman, uh, but um, uh, in some ways this debate goes back to uh, the Burley and Dodd debates of the 1930s, which uh, uh, perhaps has not been cited because Burley and Dodd, I think, were both uh, lawyers. And uh, so um, the, that debate took place in, in the pages of the Harvard Law Review. But it shows just how, um, how long we've been talking about some of these related issues about the uh, social responsibility of companies and uh, versus the, uh, the, 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 their, um, the, the accountability towards uh, uh, shareholders only. So let me start with uh, sort of uh, laying out the map uh, for what I'm going to say. I'm going to start very quickly by saying a few words about uh, what is the problem uh, that we see or that we've identified in, in Europe, uh, our response to that, then a few words about um, the uh, work we're doing on the uh, non-financial reporting directive, including on standards, and then a few words about the uh, IFRS Foundation's uh, consultation. Uh, in terms of the problem, uh, it, it's very clear uh, the, the message we're getting from investors, but not only investors, other users, civil society organizations, that they consider that the information that they are receiving from companies today uh, is, not, uh, is not adequate, it is not comparable, it is not uh, always relevant. Uh, there's been some references already to the boilerplate disclosures, I think. There is, uh, unfortunately, in this area, as in the area of, uh, of uh, financial reporting and NBNA, uh, quite a bit of boilerplate disclosure. Um, and uh, there's also a question of uh, reliability of the information, since, uh, at least in Europe, uh, very few countries have uh, so far imposed uh, strict assurance requirements on uh, this type of information. So we're faced with um, a bit of an alphabet soup of uh, standards, frameworks and initiatives uh, with new ones emerging on a monthly basis. Uh, last month, in, sorry, about two months ago now in October, uh, the World Economic Forum and the International Business Council uh, put out um, a, a paper uh, trying to uh, uh, identify some common metrics. CFA Institute has recently also uh, published something for um, asset managers. So uh, this is a very dynamic area uh, and one in which there's a great deal of fragmentation. Um, and this reflects uh, to a certain extent also the lack of maturity that we have in this area of uh, non-financial or sustainability reporting, uh, which seems to be the preferred term. 
Um, and in that sense, we're not really in the same situation today that we were in the early 2000s when the EU decided to go for uh, IFRS uh, or IAS, as they were then called, because uh, at that time, uh, it's, it's clear, it was already clear that the uh, IESB um, uh, was really the, uh, the 800 pound gorilla in the room. Uh, today, uh, that, that is a slightly different uh, situation. But we're now faced with a, an urgent uh, political and economic uh, challenge, uh, especially related to climate. And the question is, what do we do? So in Europe, uh, in, in 2018 already, we published a sustainable finance action, pro, uh, action plan, which uh, already uh, at that time also included some uh, legislative uh, proposals, which have now uh, largely been adopted. Uh, including the regulation on uh, sustainable, uh, sustainable, sustainability related disclosures by uh, investors, um, the taxonomy regulation, and there were others, uh, and there are more on the way. Uh, for example, uh, colleagues in the Commission, in the Justice Department in the Commission are currently looking at a package on uh, sustainable corporate governance uh, and uh, that, that would include uh, the possibility of introducing due diligence requirements for in the field of environment and uh, human rights. So the work we're doing on the non-financial reporting uh, directive and on the possibility of using future standards in Europe uh, fits within that broader picture. And that means that um, the, 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 the standards or the disclosures that we're looking for uh, have to also uh, fit with the needs of that broader uh, legal uh, framework. In, in that sense, the, um, the uh, disclosures or, or the, the non-financial reporting directive and any possible future standards uh, are kind of the, the foundations for the successful implementation of uh, several other parts of the EU's uh, sustainable finance uh, policy. And as I said, the basic problem is that today we're confronted with a lack of comparability of information that's disclosed by, uh, by uh, companies. Uh, lack of uh, relevance and, and, and reliability. Um, and that is partly because the non-financial reporting directive today leaves almost total flexibility as a very high level directive in some kind and in some cases has been pretty much copied and pasted into national law, which is not really how this is supposed to work, but that's in practice how it's been done in a number of countries. And that is a problem for both users and preparers. It, it, it means users don't get uh, the, the information they need, but also preparers, to a certain extent, even face a situation of, of legal uncertainty. And uh, I've been saying for at least a couple of years that I think it's going to be difficult to uh, resolve those problems without moving to the use of common uh, uh, standards, uh, reporting standards in, in Europe. And, and that, uh, I think, inevitably means making standards mandatory, at least for certain categories of, of companies. Um, the use of standards also would facilitate other uh, progress in other areas that we're looking at. Some of them have already been mentioned as being very important. Uh, assurance is one of them. Uh, clearly, it's, it's easier to carry out a uh, assurance if, if, if there is a, a proper reporting framework uh, against which to assure. It would facilitate enforcement and certainly would also facilitate supervisory convergence across Europe. And uh, it would also facilitate the transition towards digital reporting, which is also something that we're looking at. So how do we envisage the role of standards? And here I'd like to recall a couple of speeches that uh, uh, Executive Vice President Dombrovskis made uh, earlier this year. Uh, in, uh, uh, in at the end of January and, and in February, one of them was at an event organised by uh, co-organised by the IFRS Foundation and the European Financial Reporting Advisory Group. And uh, in that, he laid out quite clearly that uh, in Europe, we we certainly recognise that uh, companies operate globally, that investors uh, invest globally, um, and, and therefore uh, there is uh, um, clearly uh, it makes sense, and there is even a pressing need to achieve further convergence at international level and uh, that we in Europe uh, have no intention of reinventing the wheel or going it alone. We want to build on what already exists to the extent that what already exists uh, can be used, uh, but also on any uh, future developments. At the same time, um, as I mentioned before, we in Europe have already uh, adopted a legal framework that to a certain extent constrains or at least provides a framework for what we need to do in terms of uh, sustainability related disclosures. And uh, therefore, uh, it seems inevitable that uh, in any 
uh, future uh, standards that we adopt in Europe, there's likely to be that European dimension. Um, the, there's been a lot of discussion already today about the concept of double materiality, which is uh, already hardwired into the existing non-financial reporting directive, but also in uh, the, the regulation we adopted, uh, uh, we have already adopted in Europe uh, that applies to investors. Um, and of course, uh, they both already cover far more than just climate. So I think it's, it's clear that we are going to need to go faster and further than is currently uh, foreseen, uh, certainly by the uh, IFRS Foundation's uh, consultation. Uh, the speed, the, the, the time element is, is very critical for us because we are now, uh, we now have adopted a piece of legislation that requires uh, investors or financial market participants, as we call them, to disclose sustainability related information. And the clear message we're getting from them now is that in order to comply with that obligation, they need to receive better quality information from their investee companies. And that is one of the key objectives that the, the, the revision of the non-financial reporting directive is, is trying to address. So uh, finally, to close, um, how, does, uh, how could the IFRS Foundation's initiative uh, fit into this uh, work that we're doing in Europe, or how could it complement it? Um, again, we're not in exactly the same situation as we were in the early 2000s with financial reporting standards. Uh, clearly, we do need, I think, at, Europe, at, at international level, uh, con convergence and consolidation uh, because today's situation, as I've mentioned before, is, is confusing and suboptimal for both users and uh, preparers. Now, is the IFRS Foundation uh, the right organization to, to tackle uh, this international need for uh, convergence and consolidation? Uh, perhaps. I think there are arguments for and against. Uh, an argument for is uh, one that is mentioned, uh, has been mentioned in, in other uh, uh, contexts by both Erki and uh, Lucrezia. Uh, uh, clearly, the, um, the uh, IFRS Foundation is in a position to provide the connectivity between uh, financial and non-financial information, uh, which is something that we've identified also as, a, as an important uh, um, element to take into account. Uh, it has a, a, a robust governance uh, system uh, and it has an established reputation um, but uh, in substance today, uh, the IFRS Foundation, of course, has uh, done uh, very little in this area. The closest that exists today is uh, the practice statement on uh, management commentary. Um, I think a, a key condition uh, for success is uh, that uh, the IFRS Foundation must be able to federate uh, existing initiatives. Um, if it achieves that, then perhaps it, it can make a contribution to convergence and consolidation. If not, the risk is that it becomes another voice that further fragments uh, the current panorama rather than uh, uh, provides uh, further convergence. And, um, and I think there, there have been a few references to GRI. Clearly, the GRI uh, is, a, is potentially a very important player in this area. Um, and I could even go further by saying that the GRI standards today, although they're not uh, perfect and we wouldn't certainly use them off the shelf, are, are closer to the NFRDs, uh, both in terms of scope and in terms of uh, their materiality approach. Um, quick word about the climate focus. Clearly, uh, climate is, is a politically and economically both salient and urgent issue to address, and it seems a logical starting point. Um, and it is also, uh, to a certain extent, low-hanging fruit. Uh, the TCFD recommendations are an obvious starting point on which to, to build, um, and, and this is a fairly technically mature area. So, um, so uh, I would anticipate that on that area, fairly quick progress could be made. Um, uh, it's probably more complicated in other areas. If I look at the E dimension, the environmental dimension, if I think about biodiversity, for example, that is an area where still a lot of work remains to be done. It's just an example. And if I think about the social dimension, if we think about human rights uh, reporting, that is uh, something that could be politically contentious and where progress at international level, therefore, uh, may, be, uh, may be more difficult. Um, so very, uh, uh, very last, last point, uh, Christian Lloyds uh, made, made a very interesting uh, reference to democratic legitimacy. Uh, I think this is something that 
that has always been important in the field of financial reporting, uh, but it's likely to be even more so in the field of non-financial or sustainability reporting. Um, and the question I think that needs to be asked is whether the current accountability regime of the IFRS Foundation under the monitoring board is adequate. Uh, I don't think, um, uh, I'm not going to take a position on that, but I, I would venture that not everybody in Europe would uh, reply in the affirmative on, on that point. And I can see certainly um, that there are some stakeholders that would be important to include in relation to sustainability reporting that currently uh, do not have a voice within the current governance and, and accountability uh, structure of, of, of the system. And that is, I think, something that needs uh, quite a bit of thought. So I'll stop there. Thank you very much. I'm happy to answer any questions at a later stage. Thank you. That was uh, very clear, Alan. Thank you very much. Uh, Rins, uh, you are up next. Okay. Thank you, uh, uh, Marco, for, for the invitation to present um, the European investors perspective on uh, sustainability reporting and on the IFRS consultation document on uh, sustainability reporting. Uh, as you already mentioned, uh, Umedian uh, was uh, uh, quite in, uh, in, in, uh, in the early stages in favor of um, having a, a, a global standard setter uh, for non-financial information. Already in October 2019, we published a green paper on that issue, uh, also exploring the possibility for um, setting up a sustainability standards board under the umbrella of the IFRS Foundation and after an extensive consultation between October last year and um, uh, uh, the summer this year, we concluded that um, there is a common ground amongst institutional investors, but also many um, European listed companies to move forward. And um, uh, uh, we have incorporated that suggestion that um, the IFRS Foundation would be in a good position for developing uh, a worldwide standard setter for sustainability reporting or non-financial reporting. Um, I briefly explain why we uh, took that position. So I think uh, we uh, at the moment uh, face global issues and uh, global risks climate change already mentioned, the impact of, of the corona pandemic, uh, growing income inequality that impacts social cohesion, unequal opportunities uh, for certain social groups, biodiversity loss, um, uh, water crisis. Um, yeah, those are just a few and governments and politicians alone cannot solve these, uh, these issues. So investors and the wider society expects that also companies and in particular large multinationals have a role to play. And companies themselves increasingly uh, recognize that their license to operate can no, no longer be taken for granted. It needs to be earned and maintained. And investors and the wider society expect that companies not only pay lip service in contributing to solutions for global issues, but also walk the talk. They must present evidence that they make a real positive impact on society and stakeholders and on contributing to solutions. So that is one of the main reasons why we as an um, institutional investor uh, platform are in favor of uh, developing global uh, sustainability or ESG standards. And also the European Union cannot uh, uh, solve these uh, global problems by itself. It is also very important for the European Union that the rest of the world is involved and get on board. And there is therefore a strong case for global cooperation. And the second most important factor for setting sustainability uh, standards at global level is that beneficiaries uh, and clients of institutional investors push for the integration of um, uh, sustainability factors in the uh, investors' investment engagement and voting decisions. So the ultimate beneficiaries of in investment portfolios 
increasingly expect institutional investors to act as responsible investors. So it is therefore the, uh, their fiduciary duty to take sustainability factors into account. And institutional investors rely heavily on the quality of sustainability data uh, reported by the investee companies to live up to the clients and beneficiaries expectations. And one global set of sustainability standards will significantly, uh, significantly improve consistency, comparability and reliability of sustainability information for investors and other users. And more consistent and reliable sustainability information will also lead to higher quality input for the internal decision making by companies boards. And consequently, we are convinced that it will lead to better uh, decision making process within companies. And as such, it will give an enormous push for making sustainability at the heart uh, of uh, board decision making as the decision making is currently still dominated by financial information and financial matters. And consequently, uh, we very much welcome the decision of the IFRS Foundation to uh, publish this consultation document on the possible establishment of a sustainability standards board. In our view, um, the IFRS Foundation should play a leading role in the development of worldwide sustainability reporting standards. Um, it already has a strong due process for standard setting, a proven governance structure that was already mentioned, and it is widely considered to be independent and authoritative. And that authority is also very important for sustainability standard setting. And as was also mentioned, eh, there is already an interconnectedness uh, between uh, the standard setting for financial information, the IFRS, and for sustainability information. Um, and in such a way that disclosure may be, uh, disclosure overload may be avoided. Um, but we, before taking on this role, um, we think it is crucial to achieve sufficient uh, level of global support from public authorities such as the European Union, the United Nations, the OECD, uh, but also from global regulators such as IOSCO and the FSB and market stakeholders, including investors, preparers and auditors. This support is crucial for global recognition and acceptance of the sustainability reporting standards. Uh, as Alain, Alain Deckers already mentioned, the EU has uh, proven its leadership in the area of sustainability reporting. Since 2014, the Non-Financial Reporting Directive requires large listed companies to publicly report information on a broad range of ESG matters. The NFRD is su supplemented with non-binding guidelines aimed at helping companies report useful and comparable information. And this year, the EU also adopted um, uh, a taxonomy for sustainable activities, followed by extensive implementation guidance on how to disclose this information in line with the taxonomy. And in our view, the IFRS Foundation should take due notice of these EU uh, initiatives and cooperate where possible. Um, we believe that the SSB should explore uh, in the first stage what key performance indicators uh, have universal relevance for all or nearly all companies. So example of topics that could qualify for uh, generic uh, KPIs are to mention CO2 uh, footprints so scope one, two and three, uh, customer satisfaction and loyalty, the employee engagement score, water usage, the internal pay ratio and diversity. And we expect that the SSB uh, could build on the work that existing frameworks and standard setters such as the TCFD, SESB, GRI and IRC have accomplished over the years as these frameworks provide a very solid basis for the much, uh, much needed harmonization. 
And we expect that uh, uh, the SSB, once established, will click quickly make uh, the much needed progress. Um, to, uh, to, to finish uh, my introductory remarks, I think a constructive uh, stance from the EU towards the IFRS Foundation initiative to create an SSB would be extremely beneficial for the important goal of accomplishing ultimately the global accountability uh, and sustainability standards. Back to you, Marco. Thank you very much, Rins. So Pierre-Manuel, over to France. Well, <clears throat> thank you. Th thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much for uh, inviting me. I'm very happy to join this, uh, this workshop on uh, sustainability reporting today. So I'm the head of uh, sustainable uh, finance uh, at the French Treasury. So I thought I would share with you the French perspective on this, uh, on this topic. Then I'd like to touch on the political aspect of sustainable uh, reporting. And finally, uh, share um, the French ambition and the European ambition uh, going forward in this area. So starting with um, maybe some bit of uh, history, um, France has been uh, involved uh, for quite some time in sustainability uh, reporting uh, and sustainable corporate governance uh, as a whole. Uh, our first regulation in this area dates back in 2001. Uh, so it's almost 20 years ago, there is, uh, just to say there is nothing really new here. It has been here for, for quite some time now. This first regulation, so 2001, uh, crafted uh, at the early stage uh, some first uh, social and environmental uh, reporting requirements uh, for companies. And I would say it paved the way for enhanced non-financial uh, reporting that was yet to come by that time. Uh, and then a major uh, milestone was achieved uh, at the European level in 2014 uh, with the adoption of the famous uh, non-financial reporting directive. I think it was mentioned by all the participants. Um, later in 2015, uh, France adopted its first regulation applicable to investors, uh, that's to say asset managers and uh, asset owners, uh, which was um, then taken on, so to speak, by the European Union through the disclosure regulation of 2019. Um, now Europe is going much further with several major initiatives, such as the uh, European taxonomy uh, adopted this year, which is, uh, as you know, the, um, the ambitious classification of sustainable activities. So, you know, I believe this, um, this French experience uh, illustrates how member states can nudge the European Union to advance further and then in return uh, improve and harmonize their framework thanks to the European Union back and forth. Um, so now looking at the substance, I, I would like to say that this ongoing trend towards the sustainability reporting looks very technical, um, even maybe very confusing for some uh, actors. Uh, as traditional accounting is, um, but, you know, but I believe it is essentially political. Uh, it is also technical, of course, but essentially political. Um, political in the sense that it directly involves the shareholders, the savers, and more broadly, the citizens. People, um, they want to achieve our climate objectives, if I take the EU as an example, we committed to carbon neutrality by 2050. People, they want to know how to contribute to these objectives, how their money is going to be spent. And I think they also increasingly expect that the companies not only make profit, but also uh, take into consideration the social and environmental impact of their business. Uh, this requires setting good governance practices and it requires uh, to be transparent as well. And um, Alain mentioned uh, earlier the uh, ongoing uh, consultation on uh, sustainable corporate governance uh, uh, run by uh, another department of the commission that is uh, really interesting to look at. So th to that extent, I, I strongly believe that sustainability reporting standards of, of tomorrow uh, will not only be 
numbers to work out, not only be boxes to tick, but it will carry forward a, a sort of vision of society we want as people. So having said that, what's the plan? As it has been highlighted by many speakers uh, today, I think it is extremely positive that many actors, public, private, all around the world, finally take this issue seriously. We need to work with all the relevant actors globally, but at the same time, and it has been said a lot as well, this enthusiasm and rapid development of several initiatives also make it very hard to converge and set harmonized requirements to every companies, proprietors, and users. So in the face of this, um, we believe, France, and I believe that the European Union has some strengths. The first one is uh, a critical mass, uh, generally speaking in terms of the size of the European economy. The second thing is Europe has a unique ability to harmonize standards within the union through the usual legal instruments, directives, regulations today and tomorrow with some level two norms, so to speak, following a due process that is yet to be elaborated and that is being sought through. Um, third one is, I think Europe already has um, some foundations and, and some credentials in this area. We mentioned all uh, those existing uh, texts, the NFRD, the taxonomy, the disclosure, and so on. So we are just not starting from scratch. And, uh, and for once, uh, I, I think we could even say we are quite ahead of schedule. And the fourth element more recently, and once again, it has been uh, mentioned by Alain, uh, we established a dedicated task force uh, within the uh, European Financial Reporting Advisory Group, which is uh, chaired by Patrick de Gambourg. And the task force is carrying out this uh, preparatory work to help the Commission come up with a proposed review of the NFRD early the, by early next year. So again, I think it's very uh, encouraging that we, uh, that we really um, give substance to this, uh, to this policy making. So in closing, not to be too long, I would just say that France uh, supports very much this, uh, this trend and, uh, and we are uh, encouraged by the fact that Europe is going forward with speed and with resolution to become a key player in the non-financial uh, standard setting. So I leave it there for now. Uh, don't want to be too long and I'm happy to uh, answer questions uh, later on, thanks. Thank you very much. So I think we already have. Uh, so we have um, we have uh, until fifty five. So we have a few more minutes. I already have quite a few questions. So I think I propose that I jump straight into the questions. So we already have one here for Alain. Marco, will you give me the floor at some point oh. to clarify a few things? But um, yeah, let me let me read uh, Frederick Barge's question, and then you know you you come in, Lucrezia. Okay, sure. Um, so let me read Frederick Barge's questions to Alain. So could the IFRS Foundation's SSB be a strong infrastructure for sustainability reporting and ensuring effective alignment with the financial reporting towards integrated reporting, while from uh, um, an expertise resource perspective, the active inclusion of GI and the likes is recommended? Uh, he also has a second question, but let's deal with that one first. Thank you very much. Um, well, it, it's very early days and uh, the consultation um, by the IFRS Foundation is, uh, is consulting on the principle of uh, whether to, to start working in this area. So um, I'd be, uh, it'd be a bit premature to start uh, commenting on possible detailed uh, arrangements for cooperation uh, between uh, any future SSB and, and GRI and so on. Um, I, I, as I've said, there are there are arguments in my view uh, for and against uh, um, the uh, the uh, future role of the uh, of the SSB and and, and I think GRI, um, given its focus uh, and its scope and the amount of work they've already done, uh, I, I think uh, is 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 likely to play to continue playing an important role. Role. Uh, how exactly that in that interaction works is I think uh, something to be seen for the future. 
Lucrezia, why don't you go? We have yeah, 20 I, minutes. I, so. Yeah, I just wanted to clarify a few things about uh, our consultation so that things don't get lost in translations. So I, um, I appreciate the, the comment by Alan when he said the key condition is that um, um, for the IFRS uh, to have a role in this is that you would federate other effort given the lack of expertise um, since you know so far we haven't done anything in this area. Um, so uh, indeed, uh, uh, I mean, uh, one of the things that uh, we state as con condition for success in the con consultation is first of all, that this, we don't see our initiative as uh, you know, competing with existing uh, organization, okay? So we would get in only if uh, a kind of global demand for us to get in is recognized in the consultation <clears throat> process. So this has to be, as also Erky um, stress, a demand-driven process. And in that, I see an important role for, in, for, uh, for regulators and, um, and so this is for regulators in the, and, and their role, okay, in supporting this and then, you know, going forward, the role in the monitoring board. And in terms of expertise, we are quite uh, already, you know, at, at some stage already in uh, discussing with TCFD on how to absorb in case we would get the green light, the existing capacity, um, especially with the TCFD, which is a task force, uh, which will have to find the house somewhere and that house could be the SSB if that project would go ahead. Now, on democratic legitimacy, I think that this is indeed as an extremely important point, and this is why a global standard setters uh, should be very careful in going immediately to double materiality because the world is not going to be revolutionar revolutionarized <laughs> through standard setting. Okay, so that we need, uh, you know, a, a bunch of different policies uh, and these policies uh, have to be the result of some democratic process. So it's not some technocrats and not us uh, or the EU without the support of, of the parliament and the votes and the process and so on to decide about uh, what are the criteria and so on. So for that, the governance is this is the reason why the governance has to be at the center of this discussion. And uh, okay, so if we are not legitimate, uh, and I agree with some of the things you are saying, uh, and this is, uh, you know, we, we could have this discussion, but at, le at least in the monitoring board, there are Minister of Finances, there are the regulators and so on. So, and this is better than to take, a, you know, some organization and then to give it this incredible scope for action, especially if you're going for uh, double materiality. So I think that I agree with you that uh, the, the legitimacy is at the center. And uh, so, you know, whoever is gonna take this job as global standard setter, not regional standard setters, uh, will have to have the appropriate governance which would give it the legitimacy. So maybe following up on this uh, to I had one point to, maybe both to you, Pierre Emmanuel, and to uh, Alain. Um, you, Pierre Manuel, spoke about us in Europe having uh, lots of experience in harmonizing uh, standards or in adopting common standards, which is definitely true. I mean, that's what minimum standards in the single market are based on. But it's a general principle that we adopt minimum standards, which pose a common consensus. And then if one of the member states wants to go beyond those standards, it can, of course, do so. But what's important is compatibility. So why, I, I, I don't fully understand the contradiction here. Why can one not strive to have a minimum global standard that people can adopt and, you know, even if it's single materiality and then the EU can go further anyway and France can go even further than the EU if that's what's desired. Well, am I being naive or what, what's the problem here? So maybe both you, Pierre Manuel and you, Alain, can react to this. Well, maybe just uh, just a few words to, to to address your question. First, I, you know, I'm I didn't mean to to simplify the uh, the situation in Europe. It's uh, it's also a complex matter uh, in uh, in the union how you you set the norms. Uh, as you as you said, we well we have the regulation 
uh, with direct effect in every uh, member state, but we, we also have the directive and then we have some leeway to uh, transpose those directive depending on the priorities of each, uh, of each country. But then you also have already some sort of uh, level two norms in, in the union. You have the delegated act by the commission, but you also have some technical standards that are adopted by the uh, uh, supervision uh, uh, agencies, uh, including the, the ESMA. And then you have the national, uh, the national norms. And sometimes, as I explained uh, during my uh, in, uh, introductory uh, comments, uh, sometimes we, you know, we like to go further than Europe and there is this uh, sort of, uh, of movement back and forth with Europe catching up and so on. So we, we have all, all those things. Um, then when it comes to harmonizing with the uh, other initiatives outside Europe, I, well, I, I'm convinced that we, we have to do this work. Um, you know, every time you have an international initiative that is gaining ground, that is, uh, widely accepted by many players. The TCFD was mentioned. I'm not here to say whether it's going to thrive or not, but for sure it, uh, it has some, some success. I think it makes sense for uh, every jurisdiction to take uh, on uh, those um, successful uh, international standards. When then, finally to your question, uh, is there any contradiction with, um, with um, you know, um, having your norms and, and uh, coordinating with the others. I think there is always a trade-off in terms of, uh, on the one hand, you want to harmonize, on the other hand, you want to be ambitious. So you might end up with a very low common denominator and that's something we would not like to, to end up with. And the second thing is how you can weigh yourself on the definition of the norm. So that's the rule of being a standard setter. Uh, of course, this is also very uh, crucial in this discussion. Now, do you want to maybe add something to this? Yes, th uh, thank you. Um, uh, ju just to um, uh, in an answer in two parts. Uh, first of all, as, uh, as, as, as I mentioned earlier, and as uh, Pierre Emmanuel also referred to, uh, we've, uh, we've asked uh, EFRAG um, to um, provide recommendations about both uh, what the future architecture of uh, standards that we could use in Europe might be, uh, but also about the governance of the standard setting process. And uh, those recommendations, um, we have explicitly asked that they take into account uh, the, the interaction with, uh, it, with uh, international standards because as I, as I, uh, or existing standards. Because as I said before, um, we are very clear in, in Europe that we we uh, do not want to unnecessarily fragment uh, markets and, and, and there's certainly no intention of reinventing the wheel or going it alone. So, so that is a very important part of the work that the FRAG task force is doing. It, it is currently uh, mapping, analyzing uh, existing initiatives. Uh, and I would anticipate that whatever happens in the future, there will be a strong element of cooperation between Europe and, and, and the international level. Um, in terms, again, of, of the specifics of the IFRS Foundation's initiative, certainly as currently phrased, and I do as currently framed, and I do completely acknowledge that the uh, the, the the level of, uh, of, of ambition in, in in the consultation is is seen as a starting point, but as currently framed, uh, that cannot be the on, the the whole answer, uh, for the reasons I've mentioned before. First, uh, double materiality is clearly embedded in uh, the European legal framework already. And so whatever standards we would adopt in the future or use in Europe, uh, we would have to have that double materiality, have to reflect that double materiality perspective. And in terms of material scope, uh, our, our legislation already today goes far, further, far beyond uh, the uh, climate area. Uh, that is true both for the non-financial reporting director, but also for the sustainable finance disclosure regulation. So we'd have to go before. And just one uh, um, uh, detail about a comment you made before. Uh, we do not always in Europe uh, have um, minimum harmonization. Uh, and there are, that is, that is certainly uh, true in a number of areas. But uh, for example, in the field of financial reporting, when we adopt uh, IFRS in Europe, 
that is the standard that uh, sorry i'm having problems with my lighting gear um that is the standard that um uh, must be used across europe and there is no deviation possible for that neither in terms of adding or subtracting from the requirements of the standards yeah of course you're quite right if it's a regulation that's it so you know i mean you you're, you're quite right uh, which doesn't mean that you cannot go i guess beyond the regulation. I mean, you must comply by the regulation, but if you add something to it, then you can as a member state. Uh, that, that's sort of what I meant. Uh, but I guess that's theoretical because people really don't want to do this. I guess it's called gold plating, but you know, I guess some member states might, might actually do that. So that's, that's really what I had in mind. Um, so I think we had one other question on uh, which on the involvement of the stakeholders so the question comes from Victoria Azizi, and she's actually asking me, but I'm not going to answer this. Which stakeholders do and do not have a voice in sustainability uh, reporting? Um, so um, do you want to, does one of you want to answer this? Maybe, I think it's a clarification question. Maybe I'd just, uh, just like to raise one point and it's related to what I said about the political dimension of, uh, of non-financial uh, reporting. Um, I think there is uh, some actors you, you don't have uh, in the uh, accounting area. You don't really see NGOs involved. They don't really care so much about the accounting um, topics uh, unless it touches on uh, taxes or all these sort of things. But when it comes to environment, to climate, to social and governance and all these uh, issues we are dealing with, uh, I think we will seriously need to uh, take them on board and to associate them to the decision-making process. That's also why we uh, spoke to legitimacy, I guess. That's a very important point. Marco, can, can I make a comment on double materiality? Yeah, yeah, Rins, please. Uh, yeah. You've read the question for you, which I was about to read. Very good. Yeah, please but go I ahead. would also like to, uh, to, to highlight that uh, it is quite an... an, an uh, artificial split from an investor's point of view. So uh, we not only want to know um, the impact of ESG risks on the financial performance of, uh, of companies, but uh, institutional investors also would like to know what the impact is of the company on the wider society and, uh, and the environment. Um, and as in particular, institutional uh, investors also evolved in the last couple of, of years that they uh, also take into account uh, the stakeholder interests in their uh, investment uh, decisions and in their engagements uh, and in their voting um, uh, policies. I don't think that we should have a, a, a principal debate between single materiality and double materiality. I think it should be wise for the IFRS Foundation to, um, to, to reformulate the target audience of uh, the reporting, the reporting standards uh, initiated by a possible sustainability standards board, but also the current ISB, and that should be on the institutional investor with a long-term horizon that takes into account um, the interest of wider society and, and all stakeholders of, uh, of the company. And therefore, we believe that it is quite an artificial split uh, between double and single materiality from an institutional uh, investor's point of view. Uh, so... Can I... Could I just come back on the issue of the um, uh, stakeholder representation? Yeah, please, please, Anna, please it, do. Yeah. It, is very, it is a very important one, uh, and it's one which um, has been uh, quite complex for us to deal with in, in the Commission. Um, traditionally, when we dealt with um, financial, mar fin uh, financial market legislation, uh, it was seen as a very sort of niche area, uh, and uh, we were left alone in our department to, to deal with it. Um, I can tell you that is certainly not the case today with the work we're doing on sustainable finance and in particular on sustainability reporting. Uh, we work very closely with uh, a range of other departments, obviously environment, uh, people dealing with environmental policy, climate policy, but also uh, employment uh, law and, 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 and so on. Corporate governance has also been mentioned before. 
uh, and uh, they are following and are involved very closely in the work uh, that the EFRAC task force is, uh, is doing, for example. Uh, and that is why also in the EFRAC task force, we specified in the mandate that we uh, sent to ESMA, to EFRAC, sorry, that uh, there should, there must be representatives from uh, civil society, environmental NGOs, um, uh, consumer groups, uh, tra uh, trade unions, but also uh, from a range of other um, uh, sort of uh, authorities that are not traditionally involved in financial markets. Uh, and uh, two examples of those are the uh, European Environment Agency, which is uh, participating in, the, in, in, in this task force, and the European Agency on Fundamental Rights. And we also have an environment agency from one of the uh, national, uh, from one of the uh, member states of the EU in that in that task force. So that shows the very wide interest and political uh, attention that is 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 uh, given to this work. Uh, and I think um, if uh, the IFRS Foundation became involved uh, in in this area, that that potentially raises questions, for example, about the composition of the monitoring group, uh, the monitoring board. Sorry, thank you. So I think we can have one more question. So does the, do any of uh, the uh, other panelists, uh, Dirk, uh, Adrian, Christian, Lucrezia, do you want to ask uh, a last question from the panel? So I, I, I would have a question. Yeah? And, and yeah, it is please, acting a bit from, say, the, 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 the current reality, say, the coming five years. But if you take a, like a long view perspective, I could imagine that ideally you would want to have one base of information, indicators uh, that is globally aligned, uh, single materiality, double materiality, and then each legislation, each stakeholder using that part that they think is relevant. Uh, to me, it makes less sense that legislations, legislatures have different set of indicators they want, but they can have different uh, policy. For example, do they want to tax something or create tax incentives or otherwise? Uh, so long term, to me, it would make less sense to have different systems of indicators. Um, but how it is used, that's something that could be very well determined by the democratic process. I was wondering how, how, how you'd look at that. Uh, Pierre-Emmanuel, Alain, does one of you want to answer this? Rince? Well, um... Can I say one thing so that then can they respond? I mean, I, I yeah. think I'd like to know what uh, the EU and, and, uh, and, and France think about the idea of having a nested, a nested approach to standards. So uh, a global organization, whatever it's going to be like, okay, with the appropriate governance and so on to be discussed. Uh, setting uh, a core of global standards compatible with the heterogeneity in public policy and the legal frameworks around the world, but uh, nested uh, on, uh, you know, more ambitious uh, effort uh, for, you know, driven by, for example, the EU or possibly the US tomorrow with the new administration uh, or, you know, the more ambitious uh, uh, jurisdictions. I mean, if the aim is global, shouldn't we global convergence should we see that dynamically and uh, and then aim at, at a kind of nested approach so that we don't start with completely different uh, ideas then that will be irreconcilable later on yeah because let me just add to this i think you know looking at this from the first panel global perspective i mean we have to convince india china the united states brazil that this is a worthwhile effort, you know, how, how do we do this? And I think we haven't really uh, discussed that. Maybe we'll discuss this in the next panel. It's Lucrezia's suggestion, one way of achieving this. So maybe that's our last question. So um, uh, Rins, uh, Pierre-Emmanuel, Alain, maybe you all want to respond to this. Yeah, maybe I, I, can, uh, I can kick off. Um, I, I, as I said, um, uh, from the Commission's, European Commission's point of view, um, we, we have no intention of uh, reinventing the wheel or going it alone. So I think um, uh, there is likely to be complementarity between work done at international level and work that we need to do in, uh, in, in Europe. Um, exactly how it work, uh, how, how this would work, whether this would be the sort of nested approach that, uh, uh, that Lucrezia has just mentioned or, or, or something else, 
uh, we, we'd have to see. Again, we, we've got a we've got the FRAC task force working uh, on on this topic of the architecture of future standards, and, and one dimension that we they, that, that we have asked them to look at is precisely that: is the interaction between uh, the work that needs to be done in Europe and and, and international standards. So uh, there are various possibilities that, that that can be foreseen. I think. Uh, Rins? Yes. Uh, uh, now, from from an from an in, in institutional investor perspective, we we, we should avoid uh, duplication. So um, um, there is an evident risk of um, fragmentation if each uh, jurisdiction would establish its own sustainability uh, reporting uh, standard setter. So. Um, uh, we, we clearly need, uh, uh, at a global level, uh, a standard setter. At the same time, we recognize that there is now momentum in, in the European Union. Um, so uh, we should not lose steam from, from that uh, momentum at, at this moment in time. But hopefully, uh, the European authorities would also focus to bring their own standards in, in the upcoming years uh, all, uh, at a global level. So to work cooperatively with um, the, uh, the hopefully established sustainability standards board and in due time that uh, a, a, a European standard setter is not really necessary anymore, but that the European Commission European uh, authorities uh, can take part in the due process of a, st uh, a, a worldwide sustainability standards board. That would be my ideal picture on the long term. Okay, so we are almost out of time. So let me try and uh, say in one sentence, two sentences, what, what I heard. So I heard that uh, Europe is fast, we are ambitious, uh, and uh, that's good, I guess. Now, the challenge is how we can also ensure that we remain globally compatible and that we make uh, constructive contributions to the global uh, effort to achieve a global standard. I, I'm happy I don't have your jobs, uh, but I think at least one thing that we all agree upon is that it's a global problem that requires a global solution and Europe wants to make a contribution, uh, you know, which is why we've all convened here, I guess, uh, on a Friday afternoon depending on what time, what time zone you're in uh, on the time. So this is 6.50, uh, this is 5.57 Central European time. So we take a three minutes break and then I hand over to Dirk, who's going to, going to moderate panel three with our uh, two uh, securities regulators, uh, Stephen Majul from uh, ESMA and Tajinder Singh from IOSCO. So thank you very much uh, to this panel. Very interesting. Thank you.